Peter Johns, how you doing, buddy? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing good. Well, as you know, Tim nominated you, and uh, the rule is once you're nominated, you can't back out, and uh, it's a rule that I made up, so just go with it. Okay. Uh, anyway, I had a great time with Tim. He came by, uh, and uh, yeah, we spent the whole day here just having fun. Yeah, that was a really good interview. I like that one. Yeah, Tim's a good dude, man. He's, uh, as you know, he puts in the work, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, Peter Johns, former former FTR shooter. Is that how we're going to do this? Yeah. Uh, also known as. <laughs> uh, Formerly known as. Yeah, right. So uh, I've known you for a while. But how do you even start shooting TR? Is that where how we met? You were shooting TR? Uh, actually, the very first time I shot an F-Class match, I was still waiting for my first actual F-Class rifle to be built. And I shot at CTSA. Okay. And you were there. And that was the first time I ever met you. But I didn't even know who you were. I didn't know you were as big a deal as you are, you know? All right. Interview's so. over. <laughs> 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 uh, wait, who... Yeah, well, that was where I, that's where I shot my first match. Yeah, that's where I shot my first match too. So it's it's an interesting uh, little range that uh, more people than than I can count have started there. You know. Yeah, it was interesting the way it, when when I started there, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have pits, so yeah. you had to shoot, and then you had to come off of your rifle, and then the pits people would run out from behind the hill and go and score all the targets and then come back. And so you had a, you know, a minute, a minute and a half between shots. And so it was a, it was a pretty tough match, especially when the wind would switch there. And you, you really did learn a lot about Mirage and they had that draw between, uh, between you and the target. And so the, the wind would shift and sometimes it'd be different directions down there than it was at the, at the actual firing line. So you really had to pay close attention. If you wanted to shoot well. And all they had was this little red flag on the top of yeah. the berm. Yeah. And that's all you had. And, and that and Mirage. And it was, uh, again, you know, that just goes to show you that as long as you give people a place to shoot, they're going to find their way to number. A couple of things are going to happen. The ones that are going to get really serious about the sport, like you and I did, we're just mm -hmm. going to go and find other places to shoot at, more competitive. But the guys that just want to shoot and have fun, they're just going to stick around and stay there, and they're going to have fun. They're going to love it, and it, they're going to become better shooters, but that's as far as they want to take it, which is perfectly okay. Yeah. Yeah, so my, my first F-Class gun, I, I'd met uh, Ronnie Santhoff mm -hmm. uh, at a steel shooting match in South Texas. Uh uh, hell, that was probably Docs. 2000. Yeah, Doc's place. Uh -huh. And uh, it was probably 2010 ish. I'm guessing that's, um, that's a wild guess, but somewhere around 2010, I think. And uh, Ronnie talked me into trying FTR because that's what he shot. And he was like, You need to get an FTR. It's cheaper, which come to find out it's not <laughs> any cheaper. It's exactly the same amount of money. It's just <laughs> a different way. <laughs> He just so. the difference between TR is that you 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 spend it thinking well at least I'm not shooting open at least it's yeah. you know and you have that that uh, that uh, misconception that well at least I'm not shooting yeah. open at least it's not that expensive it turns out it is it's just <laughs> yeah I mean the only thing you save you know what a couple of grains on each load of ammo and maybe a little bit longer barrel life <laughs> that's a about it. Bit. So. <laughs> so anyway, so Ronnie Sandhoof, which, uh, by the way, he is, uh, he kind of got me started in machining. He was the first guy that kind of taught me the ways of the lathe, which is, uh, you know, kind of see how this is going, but anyway, continue. Yeah. So Ronnie. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Ronnie built my first one and it was off of a, a hunting 30 out six Remington 700 action. And, uh, you know, to be honest, I didn't, I didn't really know what I was doing with loading or load development or anything like that. And mm -hmm. So, you know, I was leaning on Ronnie pretty hard for loads and what I should do and shouldn't do. And, uh, just kind of went from there and lucked into a load at one point and 
that particular gun shot phenomenal. The, and once I found the one load it liked, it shot phenomenal from that who, point who, on. Who built your first rifle? Ronnie. Ronnie did? <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, that was that, that one I was telling you about. Yeah. He can build a pretty good rifle. Does he still build? Yeah. What's that? Does he still build? I don't know. I, I know he does Jennifer's work, right. and she always kills. So <laughs> yeah. she does really well. So yeah. uh, I'm not sure if he's still doing that. I know he's real big into race cars now, so he mm-hmm. does a lot of the nostalgia race car stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, I, would, I talk to him you know, fairly frequently about that. So, mm-hmm. so, so he shoots. Uh, so he builds your rifle, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, like you said, this, this thing just shot amazing. From, mm-hmm. the, from the get-go what were you shooting before uh so i had a savage uh varmint low profile rifle that i bought a shilling uh seven psalm barrel for it to hunt with mm-hmm. and so i went to ctsa and i shot one match with that gun and that's when i found out i had to turn had to take my break off to shoot <laughs> I shot off a Harris bipod. And so, yeah, that was a, that was an interesting match. Uh, but that was my first one and I, I did pretty well. Uh, I don't think I won that one. Uh, but I remember Ken Schilling, the match director, he's a good friend of mine too. Mm-hmm. He, uh, uh, he came up to me afterwards. He's like, I don't know if you know this, but you beat Eric Cortina today. <laughs> <laughs> did you? And I said, I said, who's Eric Cortina? And he pointed at you. <laughs> and I went over and talked to you. That guy over there. And, uh, so I went over and talked to you for a little bit. But I was like, man, I, I didn't even know that was a thing. But apparently uh, Eric Cortina is a pretty big deal. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, that was the thing about CTSA. And and, uh, and it's it's understandable, right? Like yeah. uh, I couldn't. And then I, I, I would go, for example, if I had just a. I don't know if I had ammo to burn or if I had just whatever. I'd be like, you know what? Instead of burning them off here at the at the house, I'm just gonna go to CTSA and just shoot, right? Well, then it again, it just it's just how it is. I found out that I had this massive target on my back, right? <laughs> and I'm like, I can't do that. If I if I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna have to go and just like treat it like a like a like a real match because and you know it's understandable, right? But, yeah, uh, I mean, we kind of do the same thing at Bayou. Like, you have, you know, three barrels worth of partial loads loaded up, and you got all this loaded ammo, and you're like, none of it really goes with anything. It's like, yeah, I've got to break in this barrel. I'll go shoot yeah. all of them and see if any of them happen to be good in this gun. Yeah. And then yeah. you lose, and people go, I beat Peter Johns. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. It's fun. It, yeah. it just gives people something to, uh, to uh, kind of something to chase, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so you shoot CTSA. How how did that? I mean, sounds like you did well. Yeah, I did. I was doing really well at CTSA, and I was like, "Oh man, I'm I'm way better than than, than anybody in the whole country. I'm going to be amazing. <laughs> this is going to be awesome." I was like, "I'm going to go to Bayou Rifles, and I'm going to beat up on these guys at long range, and this is going to be phenomenal. This could be the best time ever." Uh, and then I got a really rude awakening. My first match at Bayou Rifles and FTR, I showed up and like, I believe Johnny Ingram was shooting then and Brian Schneider and, uh, Omar was shooting TR and there was a bunch of, you know, top notch TR shooters there. And I showed up and just got demolished. <laughs> I mean, like I, like I never shot a gun before. And I was like, it, 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 uh, it, it basically lit a fire. I was like, I don't want to be this bad compared to other people ever again. So uh, I had to figure out a way to, to, to learn how to win and, and compete with those guys. And so that was my drive to, to learn how to shoot a little better. So Tim and I discussed this and uh, I told him there's two people that are going to show up to buy you the people that are going to, okay, just about everybody's going to get their, their ass handed to them, but they're going to look at it two different ways. They're going to say, this is just way too much for me. And they're just going to go away. Yeah. Or they're going to realize how good of an opportunity they have to learn from all these people and yeah. just, just bear down and take some beatings and then pay their dues and then get as good as them or better. Kind of like what you did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was a, it was a hard lesson, but it was good because I got to go out there and I, I saw 
top level equipment across the line. Uh, all the guys were shooting the, the best stuff that you could buy. And so I, I got the opportunity to go and see what works and kind of pick from all those things and decide what it was I wanted to go and, and, and shoot and build. So I knew that my Remington 700 with my Bell and Carlson stock was probably not going to do it for the long run for FTR. And I was going to have to actually lay down some money for that to come up with a for real build. So, <laughs> Isn't that how that typically works? Uh, obviously, nowadays, when people ask me, what should I build? I say, buy the best equipment you can because you're yeah. going to end up there anyway. And yeah. so you have two and options. If you decide you... If you decide you hate it, then you can sell it and get your money back. Exactly. You're not sitting on a, you're not sitting on a hodgepodge Remington 700 with a worked over hunting stock. So. Exactly. That's that's precisely what I tell them. Go buy the best rifle you can buy, and if you don't like it, you can sell it. And if you do like it, guess what? You have a great rifle. You're you're done, right? Yeah. But it's a it's a it's it's a big step for a lot of people to go and spend. Now what would you say? Dollars. Yeah, about ten grand. That's what I was going to say. Ten's a pretty decent number to start with to get get into the game. Even even in TR, I mean, you can't you can't cut any corners in TR. There's too good of shooters in TR. Right. You can't if you want to be at the top of the the heap in a major match, you got to have top of line equipment, and it's not cheap. So, so let's talk about that because a lot of people say, "Well, this is a, this is an arms race." Uh, what what do you think about that? I mean, so. You know, I've kind of come full circle on this. I think that if you don't, if you're new to the sport, the easiest way to get in and become competitive is by the top level equipment and to, to make it work. Now, I think someone like yourself that can build rifles or like Ronnie or any of the, or Omar, you know, the top level gunsmiths that are out there, they could go and take a Remington 700 and, and fix it up, get your fire control right, get everything proper on it and straight and true and everything. And they could probably make it to where it would be competitive on a national level, but that would require so much work from them to get it to the same level that the hours they would put into it probably weren't worth what it would have just taken to just go buy a bat or whatever. Yeah. Which is, as you said, we can do it, but we don't because it's yeah, just not and there's worth a reason it. why yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just not, not worth it. it. Yeah. And Back to the same point you made earlier. If if I ever want to get rid of it, I have yeah. a Borden or a, any other top of the line custom actions versus a worked over Remington 700, which is yeah. it's not worth the money, right? It's just not worth yeah. it. Yeah. But yeah, so but I mean, if you're starting out, that's really not an option. I just like we don't do it. Like you said, you know, me being a being able to machine. Pretty much anything. Hey, I could build an action from the ground up if I wanted to, but I don't because mm -hmm. yeah. it's just not yeah. worth it. But if somebody's starting out, don't modify your your rifle. You know, just save up the money and get yourself a top of the line custom action. Custom actions are actually free. I I I did a class at uh, the PRS Expo, and I made that point that. The most expensive thing you can ever shoot or you will ever shoot is the bullets, mm -hmm. right? Because if you have yep. a 2,000 round barrel, right? Let's say it burns out in 2,000 rounds. Uh, bullets are, what, 50, 60 cents, whatever. Let's just call it 50 cents. You're going to spend $1,000 worth of bullets per barrel, right? And then, of course, you have powder and primers and brass and all that. But in five barrels... It's going to cost you $5,000 worth of bullets. Forget everything else. Just the bullets, right? But if you buy an action right now for $1,500 and 10 barrels later you sell it, if you lose 100 bucks on it, you're going to get rid of it real fast. Yeah. It costs you pennies per round to use that action. Yeah. Yeah. Oftentimes, you will actually break even just because, you know, they keep going up in price, right? Yeah. So you can't afford not to have a good action. <laughs> Yeah, and if you if you buy a subpar action and try to make it work, and you go through three barrels trying to make it work, you already lost all that money that you would have had on you know good accuracy and good potential right off the bat. Yeah, frustrating. So yeah, the frustration is rough too, trying to figure out how to make that all that stuff work. So. Yeah, so obviously now you're on the path of 
top of the line equipment. Mm -hmm. Um, you were, how far did that rifle get you the first one? Uh, actually I made high, high master MTR with that rifle. That's that really good. And I was, uh, at the time, I know there's a lot of people that are high masters in TR now, mm -hmm. but at the time there wasn't very many people no. that made high master in TR. Uh, I shot the, uh, Lapua regional at Bayou with it in that, what was that? That was five matches and you needed six. If I remember right, it's been a while since I've looked at how you mm -hmm. make classifications. Well, it's 120 rounds. Yeah, 120. So I shot Lapua Regional, and uh, so that match got 100 rounds, and I was high master after that match. And then I went to Midland to shoot a long range match in Midland, uh, and I shot the. I went to go shoot the first relay, and this is when I found out that stainless steel tumbling my brass for too long bells out the necks, mm -hmm. and uh, they won't fit in your chamber anymore. <laughs> so. I had a box full of ammo and I was trying to figure out which ones would fit. And, uh, I shot, I think a 196 on my first match when it was calm in the morning. And then I didn't have enough ammo to finish. Wow. <laughs> so I kind of, I kind of cheated that one. Then, but, uh, <laughs> hey, he, he submitted the scores 120 and, uh, rounds, 120 rounds. Yeah. And so, uh, but then it, I felt a little better after that. Like my next two monthly matches at Bayou, uh, they added up to, to make, I master again with that same rifle. Good. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I didn't feel bad about it, but that's, that's how I actually made it the first time. So, so I mean, you were shooting really good. What makes you say, you know, I'm going to build a full blown custom. Uh, I kept getting beat up by you, <laughs> even with that rifle. Uh, like I, I was, it was weird. I was shooting the two fifteens really slow. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I don't know. I just kept getting, I kept getting third, second, third, fourth, just never could put together a win at Bayou with it consistently. And I, and I thought that I was leaving something on the table with that rifle and maybe I wasn't, uh, maybe that was as good as it gets and I just needed more practice with it. But, uh, I, in my mind, I, I could justify not winning because my equipment was not as, as pretty, I guess, as everybody else's equipment. So I, uh, I went, went on the path of building a custom rifle. You get extra points for pretty, you know that. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> let, let's break that down a little bit. Um, you, you said you don't, you don't know for a fact that that it was holding you back, but in your mind it was. That's yeah. really all it takes. Yeah, yeah. You, you if if you don't believe you can win, then you can't. Right. Whether you, you can't win, you can. If you don't believe you, you can do it, yeah, it's You're impossible right. to win if you don't think you can win. Exactly. So, what did you end up building? I bought a Kelby Panda F class action. Uh, first stock I put it in was a Shirley Brothers uh, stock, and I had uh, had Speedy build that rifle. Had a uh, we used Speedy's Reamer. We had I put a Bartline barrel on it, and uh, and I'm gonna <laughs> that that gun. Uh, I don't know how how deep I should get into this. Go ahead. <laughs> you want me to get real deep into oh, actions yeah. and everything else? Well, yeah, right. man, absolutely. That this is this is so, the thing about about you know not not having an outline outline for my for my interviews or podcasts or whatever people want to call this thing because you know like right now you 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 need to do whatever it is that you need to say for because there's people watching this right that's potentially yeah. stuck where you were you know five six seven years ago however long that's been. And whatever you yeah. say next, my my just go, son of a gun. I didn't even realize that, you know. So yeah, man, hammer down. So uh, my first barrel out of the gate, I couldn't get it to shoot as good as my Remington seven hundred. Mm -hmm. And I thought that surely I'm doing something wrong. So I tried new brass. I tried a new lot of bullets. I tried a new lot of powder. Tried a different powder. Tried everything under the sun. And eventually, I came to the conclusion I just got a bad barrel, which a lot of people say uh, mm -hmm. it just must be a bad barrel. Uh, and at the same time, I thought, well, maybe the stock doesn't fit me. Let me get a different stock. So I ordered uh, uh, Macmillan uh, Shaheen Tracker stock from uh -huh. uh, Shaheen uh, and then had Speedy put that one together for me. And then I put a new barrel on it and I couldn't get that one to shoot either. And I was still <laughs> competing with my Remington 700 because I just couldn't make that gun shoot the way I wanted. And I kept chasing this components and, you know, spent you know, probably 
year and a half trying to make, trying to figure out how to make that gun shoot good. And uh, eventually I, I think where I ended up was I read in a post on Accurate Shooter uh, by Alex Wheeler about pinfall. Okay. And I was like, well, let me look into this. And it just happened to be that the trigger combo, trigger hanger combo and action combo that I had, had an extremely short pinfall on that action. So uh, I called Kelly and it got, it was either a plus 30, or maybe more. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was enough to get me over the, uh, what Alex said was the 240. Yeah, you want to be around there. Yeah. Yeah, somewhere around there or more. And so I think I ended up like 245 and boom, all of a sudden every barrel that I had that Speedy had done was a hammer. Everything. <laughs> I put them, I tried them all back out again. I was like, man, these things are phenomenal. They all shoot great now. And, uh, and you know, it was just, it was one of those things. And, uh, and I was, uh, by the time I got that figured out, I was onto my third stock. I had a, a, a the PRT stock, the uh-huh. FTR PRT stock. I really liked that one. That was a good one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I was shooting that one and then I was doing really well with that one. Now that I figured it out, all the, all this, uh, all this issues to try to learn how to shoot. Uh, and then I started shooting really well with that. And I, let's see. Yeah. And then probably from there, that's, that's when, that's when I started shooting at the national level. I think the first time I went to Southwest nationals was in 2018 and I brought that rifle with me. Uh, and that was, uh, I got, I got fourth that year, uh, with that, with that rifle. And then somewhere along the way, I met, Kelly McMillan and he asked if I would shoot for McMillan. Mm -hmm. So then he got me on the train with the, uh, Kestros BR stock. Mm -hmm. And, uh, whenever I got that stock, it really came together for whatever reason that stock just fit me and it fit me great. And seemed like every barrel I put on that every, and at that point I'd switched to have it And Omar did the, the betting on that one, did the chamber job on that one. And right out of the gate, that gun shot phenomenal. It was probably the best shooting TR gun I had ever owned, hands down. It's amazing when when you come across the gun, right, or or the barrel or the load or whatever. It just just makes everything yeah. so much easier. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of people outside of F class. Uh, the BR guys understand, but outside of F class and Ventrist, they don't understand how critical a stock is because they 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 look at a shoot and they go, "Well, you guys are not really doing anything, right?" Yeah, and they don't realize how critical the stock is, or the rear bag, or the bipod, or you know, you name it, whatever you're using. Everything, everything is critical. It's very mm-hmm. critical. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And I don't know, I got under that BR, uh, Kestros BR stock and I set a couple national records with it. Uh, won the TSRA, uh, won Southwest nationals with it. Uh, I got fourth at nationals the, that year with it. And, uh, that was, a. Uh, I kind of made uh, an equipment error coming into the first day and, uh, or uh, I picked the wrong, uh, the wrong bullet to shoot. Let's just put it that way. Well, what do you mean by so, that? So going to the TSRA mid range, mm-hmm. uh, right before that, I'd gotten a shipment of bullets from vapor trail. He made some, he made a short run of two Oh four vapor trail bullets. Mm-hmm. And I was like, and, and they've been on order forever. Uh, and mm-hmm. actually whenever I ordered them, they were 207 grade bullets. And okay. then whenever he called me and said he had them, he was like, they're 204 now. I was like, <laughs> okay. I guess they went on a diet. That was, but, well, uh, that was before inflation, right? Yeah. They were, going, yeah. they were going the other way. Yeah. So I, I got the bullets in and I went out to, to, uh, to test them. Uh, and they shot really, really well. And I was like, okay, I have no idea what the BC is on these. He didn't either. And I was like, okay, well, I don't know the BC and I don't, I don't know anything, but I know that they, they really shoot tight. So I took them to the TSRA, uh, the mid range, 
first day I was doing pretty good, uh, but I got overheated uh, bad. And I went back to the hotel. You and did I own- personally? Yeah, personally. Okay. I, I got overheated. You had uh, what? Overheated. Okay. So. You, you, you good? Yeah, <laughs> hang on. I'm, I'm doing something wrong. Here, here we go. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so I got overheated I, uh, that day. It was really hot out, and I almost didn't come the second day. And Jason Field was like, look, here, here's what we're going to do. He's like, I'm going to leave my truck running, and between matches, you're going to sit in my truck in the AC with me, and we're just going to hang out. And so that way you can finish. And I think I was in first going into the, the last day. Mm-hmm. And so I, I showed up the last day, and that's whenever I actually I broke the national well, – at that time, it was tied the national record that Craig Martin had shot in Louisiana the day before. It was a six hundred, a six hundred forty-seven for the AG. Wow! And uh, and I broke the single string record and set it at two hundred eighteen, which has been broken since I believe. I think somebody shot a nineteen. Wow! Uh, but yes, so you this know, is a this is a, this is at six hundred. Yeah, six hundred. So for those that don't know what that means. 20 shots, 600 yards. He put 20 shots inside of one MOA target, but 18 of those he hit the X ring, which is half MOA. So 18 out of the 20 were inside of half MOA at 600 yards, which is pretty small. <laughs> Three inches. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I did really well with these bullets there. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go to nationals at Raton. And I'm going to take these bullets and I'm going to go win. And uh, I did it at the time I went and, and shot them at a hundred and shot them at a thousand, tried to back calculate what the BC was. Uh-huh. And I came up with a BC and it was pretty low uh, compared to what I was hoping for, uh-huh. uh, especially compared to the 20 X bullet. So I was uh-huh. like, okay, well, I'm just going to outwin call everybody. Cause I got a super tight rifle. Win. Well, that didn't happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> First day, I leaked a bunch of points uh, downwind uh, on both sides of the target with pickups and letoffs, mm-hmm. and and so I was I was you know a little ways down the, the leaderboard, and I was like, this is not good. So I switched to my backup rifle, shooting the twenty X's, and uh, that was the year that Jade won. Uh, Jade Del Comber. Yeah, Delcom. Yeah, he won. Uh, he won that year, and so the last, the first day, I was way behind him, and then the last of the match, I tied him with my backup rifle. Wow. So we were tied on score for the whole rest of the match. And I was like, okay, well, I, I should have been shooting the 20 X's the whole time. <laughs> and then uh, uh, maybe I could have uh, at least given him a run for his money on, on that deal. Uh, but that's that's how it went. So ended up in fourth place there uh, with that same rifle. And then going into the, uh, that's going into Southwest Nationals next for the next major match. And that's, that's when I went back to the 20 X's with that same barrel and, uh, and it shot the best I've ever seen a TR gun shoot. And wow. it was just phenomenal. So, so that was a, that, that's the beauty about a 308. Once you have a really good barrel, you have it for a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's the average barrel life for on a 308? So going into Southwest nationals, I normally would take them off about 2000 rounds. Really? Wow. Yeah. And I'd heard of people saying that they go south at 2,200, 2,300, 2,500 rounds. And, and I don't want to go to a major match with that many rounds on a barrel. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this one had been shooting so good that I was like, well, I'm going to the Southwest Nationals. I got 1,900 rounds on it. Uh-huh. And, uh, and, and the other thing, the other interesting part about this particular barrel is, uh, like I told you, at the, at the mid-range, the TSRA mid-range, I was so overheated that night after the first day that I didn't clean my rifle mm-hmm. and I never would do that. Mm-hmm. And I came out the next day and set a national record with dirty rifle. Mm-hmm. Like, well, this barrel wants to shoot dirty. And now I just found that out. <clears throat> so uh, that's why at Southwest nationals, I never cleaned my gun the whole time I was there. I never cleaned my barrel the whole time I was there. Cause I knew that that barrel uh, would run and would get tighter throughout the whole match. And it did, it shot really good for the whole thing. So that was, uh, that's why uh, <laughs> I, that probably led some people astray on the cleaning thing uh, with uh, my article that, that was written about Southwest Nationals because both me and Jay didn't clean for the whole time and we both won. Uh, but 
that's not the uh, that's the exception. That's not the rule in my, in my opinion on cleaning records. But you know, it was a yeah. uh, it was a good one. Sounds like it. Yeah. So you did a lot of winning with that barrel. Set national yeah. records. Yeah, won uh, the the TSRA mid range and long range that year. Uh, got fourth at nationals with it, uh, and then won Southwest nationals. What did you do with that barrel when you were done with it? I still have it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't do. People would always ask me because you know I had, uh, I had a barrel that uh, I won two TSRAs with back to back, right? And then uh, David Mann came up to me and said, I can't wait until the barrel gives out on you. <laughs> 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 so, you know, typical David man. Uh, yeah. So the next year, I won again, right? And, yeah. and uh, he's like, man, when is that barrel going to give out? I'm like, oh, it's done. That, this is another barrel, right? <laughs> I just had. But anyway, people ask me, what did you do with that barrel? I'm like, I turned it into tuners. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> Well, the, the thing about that one was after Southwest Nationals, uh, I didn't ever, I don't know if I ever shot TR again after that. Uh, so that was, uh, and that put, you know, what was that, about 400 rounds or so. Once it's all said and done for a team match and everything, mm -hmm. I guess, maybe 300 rounds. I'd have to go back and do the count on that. So it put, probably put me up to the low, like 23, 2200 rounds on that barrel. So it actually probably has more club matches and stuff like that. And if somebody was going to shoot, TR with it, mm -hmm. but uh, but that's that's where that one is. Southwest Nationals is that where Carpet Gate happened? Yeah, that was uh, that was Southwest Nationals. That was the year that that I won. So, uh, you want to run down to that, or at least no, from my why, perspective, why not? Why not, man? It's it's. Uh, I mean, it was a turning point in your career, wasn't it? Absolutely, that was the reason why I switched to open, and I almost quit F class altogether. Uh, was because of that. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, it was very frustrating, uh, to say the least. So, but, so tell uh, us about carpet gate. <laughs> so I'm just going to tell you from my perspective, and I'm only going to talk about things that I absolutely know for sure. Uh -huh. uh, and, and I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to hit the rewind button just a little bit too, yeah, to get ahead. a little bit of perspective from, from the beginning. So, uh, roll back to nationals. I'm at nationals and I'm shooting next to Jade and he is running carpet similar to what I've run in, uh, you know, probably 40% of the 50, 50, 40 to 50% of the field are running. And he had the Dan Poe label feet on his joy pod. And mm -hmm. I was like, man, those look like they work really well in this carpet. And I was like, okay, well, I use a Duplin bipod. I don't have a joy pod and you can't get one in short notice. So I called Dan, he's a friend of mine. I said, Dan, can you make me a set of feet for my Duplin that basically mimic your, uh, your feet for the joy pod? And he's like, no. I was like, it's going to take too much work for me to do that, but I'll send you the print for my Duplin feed as long as, or my, my joy pod feed as long as you don't share it with anybody. Mm -hmm. He's like, and then you can try to make them yourself. I was like, okay, that sounds fair. So he sends me the print and I go in there and uh, take my drill press and scrap <laughs> aluminum from, uh, from the feed store that I could put together and uh, made some feet that were as close as to what I can match his feet. Mm -hmm. and i was like this is this has got to work so i go out and i practice with it and i'm like man this shoots pretty good you know I, I like this this is a little bit better than what i was shooting before not a lot and if i don't get perfectly behind the rifle it doesn't come straight back i have to, i still have to you know get just right on it but it's still better so it's like using the joy pod with the pole label feet or and the pole label feet are just a copy of the phoenix feet so I was like, okay, so basically I'm not doing anything anybody else isn't doing. Just mine looks like uh, somebody threw it together in a scrapyard. <laughs> they have, the, they have the uh, Freddie Haltom uh, signature. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I go and I take them and I go and shoot a match at Bayou with them and everybody there sees it and says, oh no, that that's not legal. And I'm like, hold on. Why is this not legal if all these other ones are legal? Uh, and I was like, okay, well, if it's not legal, Let's find out. And so they uh, it got protested at Bayou. And I was like, okay. So I went to the mass director. Uh, at the time, I think it was uh, Ray Potter was the mass director. And I said, hey, Ray. I was like, I want you to disqualify me from today's match. Mm -hmm. And then I want to protest it to the NRA and have them look at this and decide whether this is legal or not. Because I don't want to go through all this at a 
at a national level match or anything. It's fine to do this at a club match. Let's find out the actual answer. And then we can make everyone get on board with whatever the NRA says. Right. Now he says, I don't want to do that. I don't want to disqualify Peter Johns from a club match in my match. He's like, but what, what we will do is we'll take pictures of the, of your setup and other setups that are similar. And we're going to send them off to the competitive director at the NRA and see what they say. All right. Be- before you go any further, what, what made them, what made people say that's illegal? I mean, cause I mean, I'm no FDR shooter, but I, I seen all these feet and all these different things that they try. So what, uh, what everyone, uh, if you, if you look at the rule book, it says you cannot, pro- you cannot provide tracks for the guidance of bipod feet. Okay. I think is the way it's written or something similar to that. And people have used that to say, okay, well, if you go in and you take your board and you cut grooves in your board, mm-hmm. that's illegal because then your bipod stays in these tracks in the right. board. Uh, but it does say that you're allowed to use carpet on your board. So the way everybody took that is, well, you can use carpet or similarly flexible material. I think is the way the rule reads. They're like, well, if we can put carpet down, then surely we can put feet on the carpet. So whatever feet you can have legally anywhere can go in carpet because it specifically calls out carpet as a, as a option for something you put it in. So whenever you put the skinnier feet in carpet, it makes a groove in the carpet whenever you push it back and forth, just like it would do on grass. If you put those feet down on grass and or dirt, set them back and forth or dirt or anything else, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to uh, you know, sink in to the carpet or the dirt or the grass, uh, the same amount, the, the same deal. Uh, so there was kind of a, a, a deal about that where some people thought it wasn't legal and then some people did think it was legal and about 40% of the field was doing it. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's like, yeah. why are we okay. only talking about mine? <laughs> yeah. So I was like, all right. So, you know, it, it is what it is. And, uh-huh. and so they send Eric Farmer uh, an email with this information. This is all hearsay on my part, but this is what, uh, this is what I'd been told uh-huh. uh, happened. And that Eric Farmer came back and said that uh, I don't see the big deal. Something along the lines of, I don't see the big deal. Let's just fluff up the carpet and keep shooting. Okay. So not making, basically sidestepping the question and not making an official answer, but basically saying he didn't see a problem. With it. So he That's didn't, the way I took that. He didn't make a ruling on it. He just said. No, he hey, didn't make a ruling on it. He kind of dismissed it like, hey, what's a big deal? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's no big deal, but he didn't see anything specifically wrong with it. So if he had seen something he thought was specifically wrong, I would assume that he would say that, yeah, that's, that's not legal. Right. So fast forward a couple of months, I go to Southwest Nationals and I shoot the mid range and I have a terrible time at the mid range and shoot really badly. And uh, apparently the carpet was perfectly fine <laughs> at the mid range <laughs> whenever I was shooting terrible. <laughs> it's and funny then, how that happens. Uh, yeah, and then the, fir- the first day in the long range, I shot really well. Uh, but, you know, and I can't remember whether I was in the lead, but I was up towards the top and nobody had said anything to me or as far as I knew to anybody else. Mm-hmm. The second day, uh, I picked a strategy that it didn't look like anybody else did for shooting that day. And I happened to shoot clean for the day. Uh, and then the next day coming in, they uh, mid comes up and says that, my setup was protested and that it was uh that he wasn't sure whether it was legal or not but he wasn't going to disqualify my setup because 40 percent of the field was also doing the same thing but they were going to find clarification on the rule and then try to change the rule for the future so that way it wasn't legal okay so that's that's where we were so they didn't disqualify me they didn't disqualify the other 39% 39% of the field. And, uh, and I went on to win Southwest nationals. That year. Okay. So, so mid had a talk with you and said, Hey, I'm not going to disqualify you. Yeah. But yeah. we're going to look into it. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. So it seems like then, it's over. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it seems like it's over, but then that, uh, that hits the internet and it turns into that, I was shooting a 300 wisdom. It turns into on carpet rest, and I had magic carpet and was flying <laughs> around the magic carpet and you know all the, the so the so, internet turned it into this whole big deal and it so, just I don't know. so the big deal that it was it turned into obviously I was kind of 
in the mix simply because uh, they were calling for, you know, uh, a rule to be clarified. And I mean, this, this, like you said, this was all over, right? And, and, yeah. and um, I kept reading the rule, the existing rule, and I don't remember now, but at the time I read it. And then I kept reading the new proposed rule. And it still didn't fix anything. No. It didn't make any sense. Uh, but people kept saying a rifle. Didn't you say, like, your rifle was tracking great or something? Didn't you say on that article on Accurate Shooter, something along those lines? Because they kept quoting somebody. And they said an FTR rifle is not supposed to track. Oh, no. Let's say you can take an FTR rifle and put it on a slick board if you get behind it right. If you get behind your rifle right, it'll track straight back and straight forward. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's just the way it is. Uh, pe people may not like the fact that they can't make their rifle shoot straight back and straight forward, but I've done it multiple times. I, I mean, I have, I put it on just a flat board just to practice because that's that's a good way for somebody in FTR to actually practice. Let's go out on something with a super slick surface, put your bipod down, and try to get your try to get your body position to where the gun recoils straight back. Whenever you push it back forward and you you raise up the rifle on the bag because you most likely have a adjustable or not adjustable but an angled buttstock when you push the rifle back forward you're still back in the middle of your target or at least on your target mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so if you can get your body position on a slick board whenever you get behind a you know a board with a carpet or the the joy pad or any of the the different contraptions people have come up with to try to minimize the gun from hopping to the left uh if you can do it on a slick board, you can definitely do it on that. And it really in increases the speed at which you can shoot, which is, in my opinion, very important. So so you said you were uh, using a technique or strategy or that, you know, you ended up shooting clean for the day. Yeah. Uh, what was that strategy? All right. I don't know if I should give away all my, all <laughs> hey, my you're goods. Not a, you're not a TR shooter anymore. It's all right. Yeah, I'm not a TR shooter. <laughs> this just doesn't apply to open. I need all the open people to put your fingers in your ears. Here you go. <laughs> yeah. No, so uh, going into the match, uh, I was watching the, the wind, and the wind was doing – it was picking up big, and then it was letting off, and then it would switch from the other side, and then it would pick up big, and then it would let off. And so before we even started in the morning, I'm out there with my – I have my phone with my timer going, and I'm timing the different conditions. So I'm like, okay – I have three and a half minutes when it goes to basically a boil. Mm -hmm. It'll go to a boil and I got about three and a half minutes and that's it. And then I'm going to have seven or eight, nine, 10 minutes of full on wind blowing hard. And then it comes back to that again mm -hmm. for three and a half more minutes. And uh, luckily that second day, I believe I had Jay Christopherson pulling my target. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the first match in the morning, as soon as we started, it went to, it, it went right to my condition. And I just, I shot like one or two, I mean, the bare minimum ciders, cause I wanted to get going in that condition. And I just got myself in the middle and went for record. And I shot as fast as I possibly could to try to finish in those three and a half minutes. And I did. Uh, <laughs> <Wow>. so, <laughs> That's so, impressive. I, yeah. So I was like, okay. And, and, uh, and to be honest, in the, in the first match, my gun tracked really well. Uh -huh. Like it, whenever I pushed it back forward, I got behind the gun, right. Then, you know, you have to pile all your stuff up and put it in your thing and you go down and you pull targets and you come back for the next match. And, uh, I laid down there and, you know, during the three minute prep, it ended the boil section. Mm. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to stick with my strategy. So I didn't fire a cider for 11 or 12 minutes. I was like, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not doing anything. I'm just going to sit here and I watched almost everyone complete their string before I even fired a shot. And then it came back to my condition. I shot, shot my ciders and went for record and shot as fast as I could. But, uh, on this time I couldn't get, I couldn't get behind my rifle right. Mm -hmm. Every time I was two targets to the left and I was having to slide my gun over two targets to the left after every shot. So I was bang, slide the gun over, open the bolt, throw another one and close it down. And by the time I did that and, and got back up, Jay had my target back up. So it was as fast as I could, as fast as I could shoot was as fast as he could, as, as fast as he was pulling the target. Uh -huh. So I finished in that lull again. Wow. And so, uh, I had, uh, two, 212s. Wow. On that day. So. <laughs> this, this is impressive. <laughs> 
So that was only a, a, a yeah, last day is only two matches, right? Yeah, well, that was the second day. And it oh, was second. only two matches because uh, that's the one where we had the team. Was it the team match? Afterwards? Team match, yeah. I yeah. think, I think yeah, the team match was after that. So we uh, we only sh we only shot two matches that day. And then there's two matches the last day right. because they had the banquet afterwards. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. I mean, it's it's impressive yeah. when people do it with an open gun, but you did it with a TR gun, which is a yeah, 308 off a bipod. You know, that was probably the lightest conditions I've ever seen. At, I mean, you can look at the scores. Uh, I mean, I dropped eight for the whole thing. Uh, and I think Jay was only down three or four and wanted yeah. maybe two. I mean, it wasn't, it, he didn't drop very many points. Uh, and and I was pulling for him too down at the pits and, and he had the bullet coming through. I, I think he was pulling the trigger before the, I even started pushing the target back up. <laughs> I'd hit the top and it would be coming through. And I was like, oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Keep it simple. Yeah. So, so, so you win. And then the whole carpet gate thing uh, blows out of proportion. I mean, yeah. I mean, this thing blew up. It blew yeah. up. Yeah. And to, to be honest with you, I just started a company of my, my business, the one I'm currently running now. Uh, and I just started it. So I didn't have a lot of time to practice. I didn't have a lot of time to, to shoot or do any of these things. I, I was so busy. And then this was like a sideshow deal going on with this whole carpet gate thing. And then trying to decide at what point on the internet do I go in and defend myself or what point do I just let it try to fizzle out? And it was so, just, so the defend you yourself know. part was because they're, they're half the field is saying nothing wrong with it. Just like I'd buy you. Right. Yeah. And the other side, because now you won a national championship. Do you are now a national champion or yeah. Southwest? What Southwest same thing? National. It's still national championship. Right. And, but the other half is saying he cheated. Yeah, that's that's the that's the part that stings, uh, and and that's kind of where I jumped in. <laughs> Again, it's one of those things that I, I should have just kept my fingers off the keyboard. But uh, you're a friend of mine, and to to see all these people piling on, going, wait a minute, if he was cheating, why didn't he get disqualified? Because th they were they were telling the story about how Mitt talked to you. And mid didn't disqualify. Okay, then it, then how is it your fault at this point, right? Yeah. But again, uh, then they're talking about changing the rules, and, and of course, not, none of that ever happened, did it? So, I, as far as I can tell, they said they made a temporary rule, and that it was going to be put into the rule book at the new printing of the rule book starting in twenty one, uh -huh. and. Uh, as far as I know, there they no one has ever officially adopted that rule, the the quote unquote new rule. Uh, and the new rule says in. what? The rule says I don't know exactly how they worded it, but I, I just remember it was very poorly worded and it didn't clarify anything and it kind of muddied the water some more, in my opinion. That sounds like uh, a great rule. <laughs> yeah, and uh, it basically was like you you have to be able to. Front mat has to be uh, smooth enough to slide the rifle left and right or something. Oh, they pretty much. Yeah. Okay. And I was like, anytime you put the word enough yeah. into a rule, <laughs> you've already made a mistake, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Because that's not a measurable thing. <laughs> that's good enough. It's because, <laughs> right? Is that enough or is it good enough? Because, yeah. But anyway, yeah. yeah, so whatever, that happened, and that kind of went on for a few months, or I don't even know how long. And it got to a point where at some point I just said, okay, I'm done too, you know, because it, it was just it was just going, blowing and going. So whatever. So carpet gate happened. You're like, I'm done with TR. Well, no, actually, I was I was done with competitive shooting. On oh, I see. I said, I said, well, you know what? I don't need this. Like, I, and the thing that really got me was that, you know, all these people that are saying this, it, the majority of them, actually, I don't, I don't know all of them that were saying it, but every one of them that I saw that was talking uh, trash on the internet, not a single one of those people put in the hours that I did to practice and to get better at shooting and to do what it takes to go and win a national championship. None of those people put the effort in, but it was easy for them to be a keyboard warrior and tell you that, hey, you, you know, uh, you cheated. Like, oh yeah. Well, when you get up there, you tell me how to win. How about that? Yeah. 
Well, and that ain't no lie. I mean, I'm I'm gonna. I know for a fact you, you were working hard because you would come here and shoot with me. You'd come over here and uh, at nights, you know, you'd be over here turning brass. Like I know yeah. for a fact you were putting in the work. Yeah. And so, so what I used to do is I used to manage a ranch where we took, uh, we took wounded veterans on hunting trips uh, and fishing trips about one weekend a month for about 10 years. I did that. Mm -hmm. And that's those same ranches that I managed for mm -hmm. the, the owner. He, we built shooting ranges on them. Mm -hmm. And so every morning before work, I would show up with a string or two of, of uh, ammo and go and practice mm -hmm. and I'd practice shooting every morning. So I put in a lot of reps with the TR rifle, trying to get to where I could win on a national level. And it, it took a lot of rounds. I mean, I, I shot a lot back then. And, uh, and then to, to have all that effort and all that work and have everything come together for the pinnacle culmination of winning a national championship. And then to be called a cheater was like, okay, I don't need this. And I basically had quit that class. And I was trying to figure out whether I was going to sell all my stuff or just keep it for plinking or, and do this. And I was like, ah, I don't need any of this anymore. And, uh, I believe it was, uh, you know, all my buddies would buy you that I shoot with, they, they kind of talked me out of that. And, and Omar was a big part of that. Mm -hmm. Omar's like, look, don't let them win. He's like, just come over to open. You can come over to open and, and we can get you set up and open. And then, now you, you guys know, know why we were giving Omar such a hard time last time. Cause now we got to deal with PJ in open. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Omar. Uh, yeah. So, so anyway, so you come over to open, Omar. Yeah, Omar. Uh, so I, I come over to open and I call my friend uh, Eric Cortina and say, "Hey, man, I heard the Shaheen thing. That's the place to be." And uh, and Norm had just uh, not long ago set this national record with like 150 X's or something and mm -hmm. a thousand yards. And I was like, "Okay, well, <laughs> he, the, the 184 he, he didn't, Shaheen got to be didn't, the answer." He didn't shoot more X's just because he ran out of ammo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I was like, okay, well, the answer is, uh, you, you got to shoot a 184s and the 284 she ate. And I was like, okay. So I call you and I was like, Hey, how do, how do I spec out a she ate reamer? I know how to do a 308 reamer, but I don't know how to do a she ate reamer. So you, you gave me some secret sauce on that. And, uh, I chambered the, the first, I had Omar chamber the first barrel for me on that. And, uh, I could get the 184s to shoot really, really tight for 19 out of 20 shots. And I would have a flyer and I just, could never figure out how to get rid of that flyer with that. And so Omar's like, oh, well, you need this other cartridge. So then I, and I had a whole bunch of 20 X's at the time. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay, let's do this. Uh, he, he calls it the violator, but it's a uh, <laughs> 300 solid improved. Uh, and yeah, I was gonna shoot it's a great X's name for a cartridge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so he, he, he does one of those for me and it, and it shoots really good. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I, I, I did pretty well with it. I got second at TSRA that year with it. Uh, that that's the year that, uh, Brian Blake won. Uh, okay. We, we, we tied, I think he beat me on X's that year, uh, to, to win TSRA. And then, uh, then I went on and shot the Tennessee state championship at the uh, same place where we did, did the, uh, the B squared. At zero. Yeah. Dead zero. And, uh, I did pretty good there. I think I got fourth at that and uh yeah and so just i was doing pretty well with the 20x's but then the violator with the violator i was i was violating people <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> so uh so we go on to that and then uh and then i, I went and shot at the uh there was a the roadrunner match in, in in phoenix and the wind was just howling uh-huh and I got beat up uh, by the seven millimeters that had a significant ballistic advantage. And I was like, okay, I got to do something else. So and then I was trying some other stuff. I tried 215s in it and I tried some other things. And and I think it was about that time that Lakua said they were going to make brass for the, the PRC. Mm -hmm. And so then I was like, oh, well, I, I think I think I just need to do one of those. The China. So, the China. The China. <laughs> China. <laughs> the people's republic of china yeah so uh yeah, see. I, uh, I some of my buddies had some in the area uh, on the uh 
I just the six five, and so I, I stole a piece of brass from them and necked it up and did some measurements and came up with what I wanted for my reamer, mm-hmm. and it it finally came in. Uh, and I was looking looking to try to put together a gun, uh, and I was waiting for my parts to come in because I'd ordered I'd ordered two builds worth of parts to come in to mm-hmm. to do full on builds because at the time I was I had like Doug's old rifle that was kind of pieced together is that he, you know, kind of looked like a Halton rifle. Uh, <laughs> and then I had a, I made like a bag rider for the bottom of my TR stock and it didn't work very well. And so I had all this stuff going on that it wasn't optimal. And so I was waiting for my stuff to come in and then Omar said, Hey, uh, I'll sell you my, you know, bat three L on my Sears stock. And so I bought it from him and then we chambered up the, uh, the he chambered up the PRC the first one of those and uh it just it, it was weird that one shot good every single load that i had even the ones that weren't as tight as the tightest ones were tighter than the tightest ones on my other guns mm-hmm. so like even the bad loads were better than the, than the good loads i had for my other guns and i was like well this is uh this is promising so with, uh with 184s no with 180s oh you changed the 180s uh, okay yeah, I changed the 180s. Uh, I never could get the 184s to, to shoot good in the in the Sheehan. And, and uh, you know, come to find out, uh, Johnny Ingram used my – I had I let him use my Sheehan reamer a bunch of times, and uh, he found out that it shoots absolutely phenomenal with the 180s. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, didn't, I didn't need to switch to all this crazy stuff anyway. But, uh, uh, yeah, so we, we went to the PRC, and it, and it just shot – phenomenal i mean once again omar's work is just top notch and uh so i, I shot Makes it you wonder why he can't shoot good right <laughs> <laughs> you think he'd be uh, better than that's than a shot i'm gonna give omar his due when, when he's not busy building other people's guns and has time to actually tune his rifles and and brings one that's tuned to a match i can't beat him i can't do it i've tried and when when he's got when his when his wisdom or his violator either one of them is shooting I can't beat him. When the wind's yeah. blowing, I can't beat him then either. So. Come on, man. You're ruining this, this running joke. Yeah. I know. I All know right. you guys got a running joke on Omar, but I got to Omar, give him okay. Shot, I'll, so. give, I'll give him his dues. He's a good shooter. He's a, he's yeah. a, he's an so, excellent wind uh, reader, reader, reader also. Yeah. So he, uh, he, he built that rifle and then we put the barrel on it and it shot really good for TSRA. And that was my first match with it. Uh, you know, and I was like, wow, this thing shoots good. And then I came from that uh, same load. I went to to be squared with it, and uh, yeah, you did well too. Yeah, and so uh, the the first day I didn't shoot very good. I was like, "Well, this is weird." And uh, so I, I went back and I, I was like, "It's not shooting like it did at Bayou for for whatever reason. I don't know if it's elevation or humidity or whatever. It just wasn't shooting the same." And so I went and I cleaned it really good uh, that night, and I came back out the next morning. I think I shot uh clean with it was 15 shot matches and i was clean with 13 or 12 x's or b's mm-hmm. i was like okay it just wants to be clean so the next match I was like well i can make it through the day the next match it didn't shoot quite as good and i was like okay it wants to be cleaned after every match so uh, whenever i got done with a match with somebody i, I went into the uh I shot against Todd and that's and my gun wasn't shooting very tight against him. Mm-hmm. And I went to the loser's bracket. And then from then on, uh, after I figured that out, I would run down after each match and clean my barrel down at the bottom after every single match. And it was, a uh, I, I was tired by the end of the day, to be honest <laughs> with you. I can imagine. Oh um, yeah. But man, you shot really good. You shot yeah. Really good. And I tell you what, uh, Bowers rifle, man, his rifle was tight. And I shot against him. He beat me out and and, uh, and I got fourth on that one. But that match was was crazy. It's just it was a crazy how good his gun was shooting. What what's it like? Was that your first V squared? Yeah, yeah. I couldn't make the year before because of work. So what what do you think about that match as opposed to uh the typical F class matches that we shoot? It's definitely different. Uh, I like it. The The format's completely different than a regular F-Class match. Uh, it makes you have to make win calls, even though we haven't had to see that yet. From what I can tell, the first V2 or V-squared, 
uh, there wasn't much wind in the one I shot at. There really wasn't much wind at all. There was a little bit to watch, but it wasn't much. Uh, so I'm kind of hoping that eventually it moves to a range where uh, the wind blows, or maybe it will blow the time that it's scheduled for at at uh, net zero. Right. But uh, and and I'll tell you this: I, I've shot. Maybe they need to change the, the name. Yeah. <laughs> to windy zero or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, a lot of the other guys are better at pair power than I am. Like, I, I, we do the pair firing matches at Bayou, and, uh, and you know, a lot of the guys, the, the top shooters there at Bayou are better than I am at the pair fire stuff. But uh, so I, I kind of, maybe it's probably better for me if we just keep it where it is. But uh, <laughs> I think it's more fun when the wind blows. So, uh, so, so, so you're on the PRC now, the, uh, I guess the, what would that be? A seven millimeter by six point five PRC? Because we yeah. we're calling it the seven PRC, but Hornady kind of ruined it. But yeah, no. Now, now the the, the guys just, call it the the seven PA. PA, yeah. PA. So 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 you get this thing running. I mean, you've had this thing running really good because you just finished third at nationals as well, correct? Yeah, and and uh, the the same day. Uh, me and Tim were both running. He he did one with my reamer, and we both shot it at Bayou, and both shot 640s on the same right. day. He he told the story that you had to go get a bolt. <laughs> yeah, uh, luckily the match director uh, allowed me a little bit extra time to go and run and get it. He was you know for equipment malfunction, he said that he's allowed to give extra time. But yeah, so that that was a uh, <laughs> that that was crazy. I didn't think that. Uh, I didn't think that they were going to let me shoot. And when, by the time I got back and then when they said you can, and the match director was like, Hey, you, you could have a cider. And Tim pulled up the rules and shows them to me. He's like, Hey, it says right here that you're not allowed to have a cider. So <laughs> if you break the record, you, you don't want to take a cider. I was like, okay, I'm not going to take a cider. So I didn't take a cider and I had 10 shots left in that string. And luckily I made a good wind guess on the first one and shot an X. And then I shot nine more X's out of those 10 shots. Wow. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> wow that's impressive but, or no eight more x's so it, 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 i shot uh on the last 10 shots i was nine x's and one ten. wow that's impressive not only not only because you you were able to do that but because you shot a 600 which is yeah. pretty hard to do How i was really close to shooting a 900 <laughs> <laughs> on the pair fire too <laughs> wow <laughs> i dropped one point on the pair fire uh Otherwise, I shot a, a, a 899 with 60. Wow. Wow. Well, maybe next time. Yeah, it was weird. His bolt shot better than mine did in my gun. I tried to buy it from him afterwards, but he wouldn't give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this uh, 7 PRC, uh, you were telling me, or I think it was you, or at least through the probably grade. wasn't me. I don't, I don't I tell. I was gonna say, was gonna say yeah, it probably so. wasn't you because you don't tell me anything. <laughs> Keep in mind, earlier he said he called me up for for advice, and now <laughs> check valve, check valve. It's, it only <laughs> they only they only flow one, one way, one direction, <laughs> one direction. Yeah. Anyway, right. um, you were okay. Somebody said that it, it just shot virgin brass amazingly well. I think it was you. Yeah, that's something that's pretty unheard of i this is the first cartridge i've ever owned that shot virgin brass well i've never owned another one that i thought shot better with virgin brass than it does with fire brass I and see. i don't know because it shot so good with virgin brass that all the way through nationals i still hadn't even tried to shoot fire brass wow so you shot the whole thing with virgin brass yeah wow so the uh I think part of the reason, because as you know, I have, I have that too, the PRC by six five or whatever, uh, is the headspace on the brass. It's it's by the time you neck it up, you almost have to bump the shoulder back a little because it's typically they're really short. Yeah, you know the brass, and on this one, it's not. Have you exp Have you found out the same thing? Yeah, I have a technique for uh, not having to do that. Oh, okay. What is it? Am I supposed to release everything? Everything. So, all right. So, uh, 
if you run an expander mineral through the donut, it just pushes the donut out, and that's what you're catching on your uh, in, in your chamber. Well, so if you just if, if you stop your expander mineral past on the neck, past where your bullet stops, then you don't have to go through the donut, and you don't have that problem. In yeah, the are you it. talking about? Oh yeah, duh. I, I I almost asked you if, if you're talking about on your second firing, but you just said you I don't know about first. the second firing. I've never tried that. <laughs> so so when you neck it up from six five, you don't neck it up all the way. No, I just I, I just go I go down far enough to where it's past where the, the bullet's gonna sit. Okay, and that's it. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not I'm not seating them I'm running one eighty, so I'm not seating those uh past the donut for sure. So right. there's no sense in I couldn't come up with a good reason to to push the mandrel down any farther. It does look kind of goofy if you looked at it loaded around that way because it's got a squeeze down neck below. Well, it's got a it massive like donut. That's what it's got. If you think yeah. about it, it's got this massive yeah. donut. But yeah. I guess if it works, it works, right? Yeah, I tried it and it shot a six hundred forty to thousand. I was like, well, that that ought to work. It's tough on bolts, but it shoots good. <laughs> well, no, I, I'm not running very hard either, so. Yeah, the, the, the Sheehan does the same thing that the PRC does. So uh, you know, if 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 I went back to the one eighties and the Sheehan, it may shoot just as good as the the PRC does. Well, Johnny's sure shooting his well. Yeah, and it doesn't matter which barrel manufacturer or what he uses. His Sheehan's always shoot well with the one eighties. Yeah, like I said, he's using that same reamer. So I I, I don't know if there's much of a competitive advantage going to the PRC over the Sheehan, other than you don't have to fire for him. That's it. And for for me with work, I'm so busy all the time. It's like I just don't have a lot of time. So if six five PRC brass was available all the time, I probably would never <laughs> shoot fire brass. I'd probably just buy new brass for everything. Well. Maybe I can maybe maybe we can make an agreement here and and because I I always you know me I always got a fire form so maybe maybe you can just shoot all my brand new brass and then just once you shoot it give it back to me. <laughs> yeah, I'd be fine with that. <laughs> Sounds like a deal, right? Uh, I'll lease it from you. How's that? <laughs> there you go. So, <laughs> so so this PRC, uh, we don't have a good name. I call it the PRCW just because the the you know. In my mind, and, and it's just one of those things, right? In my mind, Alex Wheeler came up with it, but you know, it's it was a pretty obvious thing to do, right? It's it's such a perfect yeah. case. But anyway, so I call mine the PRCW. The W stands for Wheeler, um, but you know, or the PJ or whatever the name is, they're calling them because yeah. everybody's now everybody has them and everybody has a distinct name for it, which is fine. But. Uh, Powders. What powders does it typically like? Uh, pretty much the same ones that the Sheehan likes. It's the same. It's it's slightly slightly more case capacity, but almost negligible more than a Sheehan. So the same ones the Sheehan likes at uh, N555, 16, 23, 4350, 4831 shortcut. You could probably make 4831 run non-shortcut. Uh, I, I'd maybe reload her 17 if you want to go real fast. <laughs> <laughs> once. You want to go really fast once. Once, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I find it's, like you said, it's slightly larger case capacity, but it's, like you said, it's... It's not, it's not enough to make it... Like, I, I don't know if you could run... Like, with a, with a Sheehan, you can run 2930, 2940, 2950 uh, with properly throated reamer with the 180s. Right. You know, you can do that, and it's and your brass will last some period of time. Uh, I don't know exactly. I've never run it that long, that hot, but you know, maybe four or five firings. But if, right. if you run, if you know, if you run the PRC, say you you decide you can get 50 more feet per second out of it, you try to run it up near 3,000, 3010, or something like that. Your brass is probably not going to last for a little. No. My guess. I, I've never tried it because I found a spot get, that was you get one firing out of yours. Is so that what far, it is? so well, out of yours so far. Oh, out of mine. Yeah. Well, um, mine's got three firings, and uh, you know I haven't. Well, you've seen my Shahane shoot, right? Yeah. So I'm like, uh, I just I. I I'm at that, you know, you were at the point where you couldn't get nothing else to work. So you're like, oh, this works. But you've seen my Shehane shoot. You have actually even said to me, what did you say that one day I got? He goes, I don't know what you're doing with that thing, but it freaking shoots. 
Yeah, yeah. That, that's where I'm at. It's like my Shaheen just shoots. Yes, yeah, you're you're over there shooting 17, 18 X's at a thousand yards with your Shaheen going, I'm going to try this PRC. <laughs> what? <laughs> well, what? Um, the reason this I'm trying sense. it is because, again, I have Shaheens that freaking, they're hammers and they're there. Nothing wrong with them. Yeah. So I'm like, I'm going to go try this, uh, this PRC. And again, I'm in the off season, right? Uh, for the next two months. So I'm like, you know, I'll try this thing because I've had this reamer forever, but you know, you guys are shooting it really well. And I'm like, okay, let me try it. But, uh, so far, um, I can match my Shaheen, but I can't beat it, you know, just, and you know, maybe there's something there, but, uh, I, I don't know. I am running it kind of hot, uh, 29, 50 to 60. That's just where it ended up. Uh, mine shot terrible right there. Yeah. Well, that's uh, what mine is shooting good. I mean, I'm shooting yeah, like it's, three inches, two and a half. It's just, it's just, uh, it's just reamer design, it, you know, however, yeah. however yours ended up being designed. It just likes that spot better. Mine, mine doesn't like it that fast. Yeah. Um, well, so. that, uh, and that's what I've heard, but I, I ran it, I slowed it down to that. Well, you called me up one day or, and you asked me, you know, Hey, these things wants to run pretty hot. And I said, well, 2920, from what I heard, 2920, 2930 is kind of where they like to be happy. You're like, Oh, well, that's where mine likes to shoot. Well then send it. Right. Well then yeah. I'm working on mine and mine doesn't like that at all. Cause that, you know, obviously I kind of, I don't, I don't chase the speed in a sense of. Oh, people said 2920, so I'm just going to load a 2920. Oh, no, I, I do a complete ladder. And, man, that's where it shot the worst. And it can shoot pretty good around 2860 or something around there or all the way up to, like, 2950, 60. And I'm like, well, we'll see. <laughs> but yeah. I don't like it that high. I mean, it's – it's uh, but I think for Parafire it would be great if, it, if I could get it to shoot really good there. Yeah, so I I ran mine at uh, at B two, probably uh, I think it was around twenty nine thirty ish. Mm -hmm. It was where where I that one. They've all kind of been the same. I think it's just that particular reamer. Now I haven't tried other barrel other brand of barrels either. So what do you shoot? That could now? be it too. They're all bar lines. Bar lines. Uh, I'm shooting Brooks. Yeah, and the bar lines just happen to be available. So it's not like I'm I'm. Uh, loyal to one brand over another like you team my up. best yeah but my best tr barrel ever was the, the krieger so mm -hmm. I, if, if krieger had a, a website somewhere with the right twist rate i would buy those and, yeah. and the size and the length and everything so yeah so my my prc like i said it's but what i was going with this is my brass has got three firings at that speed and uh and my barrel's actually 31 inches because uh they they were thirty two and I had to set back to do the PRC because <laughs> they were she, they were Shehane. I yeah. said, well, let me try this thing. But the point is, I'm I'm going that fast with a thirty one inch barrel, and the brass is still stout. Like the primer yeah. pockets are tight, and I'm like, oh, you know this, this. I mean, it is Magnum brass, right? It's it's got a lot yes. more beef. You got more meat, yeah. You got more meat around the primer pockets, so it's just you know. Yeah, because the two eighty four, it's a rebated rim. Right, it's yeah. a bigger, it's a fat case with a rebater rim, where the Magnum is just a fat case, a lot of meat yeah. back there. So I think, I think it's gonna be a hit, in a sense of long brass life. And well, and now now that the Pua is uh, postponing making two eighty four and six five two eighty four brass, and they're not postponing making six five PRC brass, I have a feeling that it's probably gonna be a big wave of people moving yeah. to it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You have to buy a new bolt. Yeah. And so that was my other issue is, is I was doing the, the violator. And the reason I didn't switch back to the Sheehan whenever I saw uh, Johnny shooting so well with mine with 180s is because I had Magnum bolts. I was like, yeah. okay, now what do I do? <laughs> so do I spend you a bunch of money on You didn't want to get violated <laughs> by buying new bolts? No. And uh, I don't know. I, I still have a, a, I still have a 300 violator barrel in uh, that shot really really well with 215s and they don't exist anymore uh so you can't buy those and i haven't been able to find them in close to two years now wow. that they've not been on the shelf anywhere and so i i don't have any and i 
don't know how to get any. So I have a barrel that shoots really well that I could go compete with with plenty of brass. I just can't find a bullet to shoot in it that I want to shoot. You're also shooting a no turn, correct? Yeah. 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 (laughs) Now, um, you know, I talked to Bart Souter and, and there seems to be a move, quite a few people moving to no turn. Uh, chambers uh, I mean I, I don't think it's better uh, in, in my case uh, I think I probably make the brass worse by turning it then I make it better I haven't found a technique that I thought was uh, good or at least better than the way it comes from the manufacturer so it seems like whenever I go back and I check how I turn brass, it, I made it slightly worse than what it was before. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, if, if I can't do better than this, why do it at all? So yeah. I ordered a reamer that was, I don't want to, I just don't want to do it. So I see. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. And it's shooting time well. too. yeah and, and it's shooting good that way. So, and I, I've heard, uh, I've heard Omar say a bunch of times, you know, you, you don't need it. You don't need to turn your brass. It's, it's not necessary. And he's usually right. Well, just about everything when it comes to shooting. So, yeah. Um, well, again, can't argue with the results. Yeah. So now you're you're an open shooter, and now you're 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 terrorizing us over here in open. <laughs> uh, again, you, you you move over to open. You got second place at TSRA twice, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you go to V Square finale. You did really good there. Yeah, fourth place there. You go to nationals and, then, and you get third place there. I mean, obviously you know how to shoot. Yeah, I just get lucky a lot, you know. Yeah, right. The more you practice, the luckier you get. That's right. And that's the weird thing is I don't I don't have a lot of uh, a lot of time to practice now, so I, I rarely practice. I kind of use the monthly matches for practice. So whenever I do well at these matches, it's almost like a surprise to me. Like I I don't go there expecting to do well but I go and try my best and I, I end up doing well anyway. Uh, Have you ever yeah. wondered if that's possibly the reason that you're doing so well, that you, you, you kind of go there with no expectations, you kind of no pressure. It's, it's possible. I still put pressure on myself because I'm by nature competitive. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I want to win everything that I, I get into and I'm, I'm a pretty good loser though. Like if I, if I don't, uh, if, if I don't win, I'm, I'm not, I don't get all upset or anything like that, but, uh, I much prefer to win than to, <laughs> right? to lose. I mean, that's kind of the reason I'm there. So giving an option. Uh, yeah. What's next? Like what's what, I mean, obviously now you're on team rolling coal, you guys are killing it. Yeah. I had to pay Norm a lot of money to get onto that team. You know, he was, uh, he was reluctant to put me on at first. Um, uh, and then I, I had to sign over a pretty big check to him to, to let me on the team. So I couldn't find another team that would take me either. So I was just sitting there oh, come flailing on. about trying to find a team. And uh, I was thinking about putting a resume on LinkedIn for it. And then, for a P- F open team. Yeah, yeah F open team. <laughs> it doesn't pay very well. Uh, no, uh, no, I, it's, it's been, it's been great getting on uh, team roller call. I'm, I'm Super good friends with all the guys that are on the team. Uh, everybody there is top notch. I mean, they are some of the best shooters you can you can be around. And the knowledge that's on that team is unreal. It, it's uh, like I'm the new guy on the team now, so I'm the one who has to get everybody's beers for them at the house and that well, type of stuff. You so. got to do what you got to do. <laughs> who uh, Chris Few is going? Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Beer's getting warm because he was the, he was the new guy, right? Until you joined. Yeah, yeah. Now it's now it's me. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm the low guy on the totem pole, but it's it's all good. Uh, yeah. So they made you back coach, huh? Yeah, and uh, to be honest with you, I was terrible at it. Uh, I, why, you know, why do you say that? Because you were a coach for Team Texas, and you guys yeah. were killing it. And I've never uh, I've never back coached before. Ah. Uh, but, uh, so I'm back coaching and, uh, it's causing me so much anxiety back coaching that explain um, the difference for those that don't know the difference between coaching and back coaching. So, uh, your back coach is your woe guy and your front coach is your go guy. In, in my opinion, that's the way the, the, I, the back I, that's, coaches, at least that's the way the back that's, coaches, that's the way we're 
Go ahead. The back coach is what? The whoa guy. Okay. And the front coach is the go guy. Right. Uh, and at least that's the way we ran it in Team Texas, and it seemed to work really well mm-hmm. that way. So I, I, as the win coach for Team Texas, I would pick the conditions we wanted to shoot in, and I would try to run our guys quickly in those conditions and, you know, chase it out whichever way it went as best I could. But then I would have a back coach who would be Skip, and he would be like, hey, whoa, whoa, stop, stop shooting. It's, it's getting big, and we don't need to shoot in this. Mm-hmm. And he would, he would stop me. And that worked really, really well. And I've never been the woe guy before. I've always been the, the go guy. You want to go. So, so I'm back there as a the back coach and I want, and my, by nature, I'm the go guy. I don't want to be the woe guy. Mm-hmm. And so I'm getting anxious with it. And it was, uh, <laughs> it was very difficult for me. And I'll tell you this, I, I wasn't a whole lot of help for Omar. Uh, and whenever I shot and Doug went back, Doug was phenomenal as a back coach. Doug was really good. I could hear him and Omar working together. And I was like, why is he not back coaching this whole time? <laughs> Cause this, this works. And, uh, and it, and it, it proved out on the score too. Cause I, if you look at the scores, I had the highest score for any single shooter for the whole team match. The okay. long so, so, uh, so the key is, uh, just let you shoot. Yeah. Yeah. That's, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd be fine if they just let me pull targets to be honest with you, but, uh, or, or be the scorer. But, I'd be uh, fine with I, I that too. I'd be fine with that too. Yeah. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, you guys put on a incredible performance. I mean, all of you guys, I consider you guys my friends as well. Uh, and I'm really happy for you guys. You guys just yeah. absolutely tore it up and I'm glad. And, and I, th- I think that has, uh, there was, you know, just like any other team thing, everybody brought tight rifles. Everybody's gun was tight and it was hard to pick the four best rifles to, to lay down and shoot. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then, uh, Omar, I, I don't know how he does it, but I've never seen anybody be able to pick a shot on how much it's going to be in a different condition than what you've been shooting in and be a hundred percent right. Every time, mm-hmm. like jumping back in, in different conditions. Cause you had to, man, he's, it's uncanny. Like he's like, it's this many, it's six, right. Like we've only shot in one, right. This whole time. No, it's six, right. Bang X. <laughs> what? This doesn't make sense to me. I don't compute. So, <laughs> but, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's right so much that, uh, that I can't, I can't, I can't explain it. I don't know how he does it. Yeah. So now nah, uh, again, uh, there's no secret, right? I mean, you guys shoot something we shoot. And when, when you guys stopped, okay, when we would stop and you guys kept going, right. We would just watch you guys shoot like, okay, what are they shooting? Right. And it's, it, that's just a, a tactic that everybody uses, right. If you're not shooting, watch the others, see, maybe you can pick up on something. Right. And I saw that, uh, you, uh, Omar was on every time. Cause you guys would jump out and you guys were this jump in and out thing. Right. Yeah. And every time I'm going, cause I'm looking at the conditions and I'm like, wow, this is different. Oh, yeah. they're going to shoot. All right. Let's see what's going to happen. <laughs> X. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. Now it is really picking up. Wow. They're about to go. That's dumb. X. Oh shit. I guess that's not dumb, but yeah, man, he was on, he was on. And, uh, that was, that was great. I was really happy for you guys to, to, yeah. to do yeah. as good as yeah, you guys and, Yeah. And, and I've seen that before because, uh, at the nationals in, 19 Mm -hmm. i was calling for team texas and uh we were shooting right next to you guys and we had a big rollover big condition change on the last match of the the, of the last shooter for the team match for the whole thing Mm -hmm. and uh (laughs) and i was sitting there i was like okay well i I told the guys i was like we're just gonna wait for for bob to start shooting again and so we're just sitting there and i'm like our condition's back and i told the guys like our condition's back bob's gonna shoot any second now it's back it's definitely back. Come on, Bob. You can shoot. Let's just see where he goes. And we sit there and sit there and sit there. And we probably went three or four minutes into this really good condition. And I was like, I can't wait for Bob anymore. And I was like, all right, give me this. And he shoots and we, we get it in there and then we just roll and we finish out. But right after we shoot and our target comes up, I hear y'all bang, bang, bang. And I was like, oh, I see what happened. 
So I talked to Bob after. I was like, I was like, man, I was waiting for you guys to shoot. He's like, I was waiting for you to shoot. I knew how many <laughs> shots you had left, and you had uh, you had more shots than we did. So I knew you, we were going to wait for y'all to shoot. I wasn't going to do anything until y'all shot. So we were playing uh, conditioned chicken. Conditioned chicken, <laughs> yeah, Ben Avery chicken. Yeah, uh, it's. Uh, I mean, oftentimes, you know, here's for the for the younger teams out there. The best thing that you can have is a good shooting team if you watch them if 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 you both are shooting at the same time you're more likely both are going to hit the brakes at the same time yeah and at that point if they decide to jump in vice versa right the, the conditions are back and yeah. then the thing about it is you think the conditions are back but you don't know for sure until you take that shot mm-hmm. right and depending on how it goes is, you know, whether the condition is back or not. And that's why oftentimes teams wait on each other <laughs> yeah. or even shooters. Right. So yeah, I've done it left. before. Yeah. I was, uh, we were at Southwest nationals the year. I got second in a uh, kind of big condition change, a big pickup. And, uh, Derek Rogers was shooting and he was about four targets down to my left. And I was like, okay. So we both stopped shooting at the same time. And it was like, it got big. And then I saw my condition coming back and I was like, okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and shoot. Let me give it a little bit of time. I was like, all right, this is it. So I throw it around and I go to close my bolt and I hear bang down to my left and I look over and his target goes down. I was like, all right, let's wait and see where he comes up. And he came up an eight and I was like, I whipped it over two lines and shot and shot an X <laughs> from where my last hole was and I walked it in from there. And I was like, man, he saved me two points right there. Because I would, I would have shot the same hole. I would have done the same exact thing he did. And it uh, just being a little bit more patient saved me some points right there. Yeah. It's it, and you know, two points can make a huge difference in, in yeah. class. I mean, t- Tim won nationals by two points over. And, that, and that's a wide, that's a big lead, right? Yeah. By today's standards. That's, not, that's not normal. Yeah. Yeah. Normally it's, it's either X's or one point. So yeah. it's, it's amazing how, how tight the game is, which leads back to, our previous conversation about having really good gear because you can't give up yeah. a single point. No, no. You, if, if you, if you start giving up points, you're, you're gonna, you're, you're not gonna win. So just yeah. no way. Yeah. So man, good stuff. Obviously you're super busy nowadays with your business. Mm-hmm. How long are you going to write this out? I mean, it sounds, it looks like you're having a lot of fun. You're, you're back to having fun which is important. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that I, I'm really enjoying F class now. It's, it's really a ton of fun. And, and I, and like I said, I go into it with not a whole lot of expectations. Uh, my only expectation for myself at this point is to not let my team down. I'm going to bring the best stuff that I have to shoot for the team. And then whatever else I have is what's going to go for the individual stuff. Cause whatever, it's just individual. The team yeah. stuff's important. Yeah, it's amazing how how much a team can carry a shooter in a sense of driving, just driving them to to do better. Because sometimes we 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 will do, and I I'm, you know I'm speaking from personal experience. I will do for the team what I won't do for myself, right? Yeah. And that keeps you going until, and it's just a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to win as a team. Yep, I agree. Yeah. All right, man. It's been great. You got to nominate somebody. Omar's already been nominated, so can't nominate. That's all good. Yeah, well, too That's bad. Gonna... <laughs> Tim, too. Tim, you know, you, Tim, just greedy like he is. He just nominated you and Omar, so you're going to have to pick somebody else. So I can't pick Omar. Is that what you're saying? Nope. He's already been picked. <laughs> I, right. I text him, so he needs to. Again, he's been nominated. He can back out. Let's see who who to nominate if it's not Omar. Let's see. Omar was taking a beating during the the Tim and and I. Yeah, I saw I saw that. And I was like, <laughs> man, that's pretty rough. But <laughs> that's probably why he was a little short with me today. I said, hey, man, when we're doing an interview, he goes, I will let you know. <laughs> this, this, it was a text, but this is how I read it. I will let you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, Omar's good. He. Uh, he, he ribs he ribs all of us right back. So it's yeah, uh, it's, it's a good he's, time. He's probably busy writing out his jokes that he's going to have to say about Tim uh, trying to figure out what he's going to say. So I did I did I did his, defend so. him a little bit with a relay one thing, right? Because Tim always oh, yeah. gets relay one. Every, we all know that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. 
Man, there's so many good people to pick from that you haven't interviewed yet. That's why I don't let you pick Omar, because I know there's so many people out there that that. Uh, and it's interesting the way this is going. I'm I'm freaking loving it because people will, you know, nominate somebody that I've never even heard of, and once I have a talk with them, it's it just goes down this rabbit hole. That's just fun stuff. Yeah, and now I haven't uh. I haven't watched all your videos. Have you interviewed Doug? No. Yeah, Doug Chicago. All right, Doug. Either if, if, I'll tell you the two people I was going to nominate. So if, now that Tim sets the precedent. Oh, it's man. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be uh, Doug Scogman and Ronnie Santhoff. Oh, man. Ronnie. Ronnie's good, too. Yeah. Yeah, Ronnie's real good. I don't yeah, know like, if he'd do an interview with you, but he's, uh, he's I, phenomenal. I saw him at South West Nationals, and I told him. I thanked him. And I'm going to thank you again, Ronnie. Uh <laughs> When I decided I was going to buy a lathe, he reached out through me through Ben Milam. Okay. Yeah, I know Ben. And Ben I said, like ben. ben said, hey, Ronnie, you know, my friend Ronnie said he'll teach you. And I didn't know Ronnie, uh, but I knew Ben, right? And uh, I said, hell yeah, man, let's let's do it, you know. You know me, Eager Beaver. I'm like, I'm just going to learn, learn, learn. And I went down there a couple Saturdays or three to Ronnie's, and he kind of showed me you know, how he ran the lathe, how he chambered barrels and all that good stuff. And, uh, that was, that was amazing for me. Right. It, it just kind of gave me that little push. And then after that, it just, it's still going, you know, Yeah. <laughs> I was, I was telling him about, you know, I, I think he knows the machines that I have now. And he's like, he goes, man, it's hard to imagine. It wasn't that long ago when I was just there. I didn't know. I didn't know anything about lathes and now, it's amazing. It's it's so yeah, Ronnie. That that'd be a good one. And and uh, Doug, Doug for sure. Yeah, yeah Mr. Scogman, Mr. Uh, Win Zero. Win Zero. Yeah. So good stuff, man. I appreciate it. And thank you for uh, for doing this. Uh, I know this is gonna help a lot of people. And uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, man. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you. See ya. Keep them centered. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>